trained initially as a physician in New Delhi, India, at a tertiary care facility, where there's a high volume of very sick people. In a typical half-day clinic, we would see 30 to 40 sick people. And my teachers were master clinicians, who taught me to answer two questions well and quickly. What's the diagnosis and how best to manage them? So as patients came into the exam room and they left the exam room, I seldom, if ever, wondered which world they came from and into which world they returned. Then I trained again in the United States, including as a clinical epidemiologist. And I learned to ask better questions. Hopefully, why is this person sick at this time, at this place, and in this context? And could it have been prevented? And this Look at a clinical vignette. We just play this out for you. A black woman, 35-year-old in Mississippi, consults a physician because she's feeling very tired. And her routine blood sugar returns a value of 130 milligrams per deciliter. The normal is below 126. Elsewhere in the Northeast, a 55-year-old white man has a routine annual physical, returns a blood sugar of 130 milligram per deciliter. To round off the corners in the country, a 65-year-old Asian man in California has an executive health checkup and has a fasting blood sugar of 130 milligram per deciliter. All three physicians make the diagnosis of diabetes. They have the same disease. Or do they? The black woman reached the threshold, crossing the threshold of 126, 30 years before the Asian man. They have the same biochemical diagnosis. But do they have the same disease? And we know how to treat diabetes. Would the disease behave the same way in these three individuals? And let me add some context. The black woman in Mississippi is a single mom, juggles two low-paying jobs, has two middle schoolers she needs to look after, and lives in a food desert. The man in Massachusetts is an accountant in Boston and is a member of a health club. And the Asian man in California is a physician who plays tennis three times a week. Do they have the same disease? Will it behave the same way? The point I'm trying to make here is the onset and courses of diseases may vary with context and place. You might think that I contrived this example with an extreme example just to illustrate a point. Do health outcomes really vary over shorter outcomes, over shorter distances? And here are some data. Just illustrative, a map of New Orleans. And this is about a one mile radius over here. So this is about a two mile radius here. And I'm looking at the most hardest of outcomes, life expectancy. If you live in the French Quarter region, you have a life expectancy of about 55 years. If you live in the Northwest, in the Lakewood region, you live 25 years longer. In other words, your zip code may be more important than your genetic code. Where you live may impact your health outcomes. Which brings us to the question, where does America live? And does it matter? The answer to the question, where does America live, depends upon time. If you rewind a century ago, we were a little bit over 100 million people. And over half the country was rural, being defined as a population size less than 50,000. You fast forward a century, and the population tripled. But most of the expansion was in urban areas. The height of the green bar remains the same. About 20% of the people are rural. Interestingly, these 80%, 275 million adults, occupy 3% of the land. The 20%, about 60 million adults, occupy most of the country. Rural America is a breadbasket. This is where we have our great rivers. This is where we have our mineral wealth. This is where we have our fossil fuels. This is where we have military installations. And this is where we go to vacation to commune with nature. So does it make a difference if you live in rural America? The answer to this question, again, depends on time. For a large part of our existence, up to about 1960, you lived in rural America, you lived longer. Then something changed. Around 1970, Life expectancy in urban and rural America started coming together on par. Fast forward a decade, life expectancy in rural areas started falling. Fast forward more, rural life expectancy falls further. 
And this issue achieved national importance because two Princeton professors reported in 2015 that middle-aged white men in rural America were dying prematurely. And in 2016, the rural people spoke at the ballot box. This rural health challenges, a mortality penalty as sometimes it is called, affects both sexes. It spares no race, although the minorities fare worse. It affects all organ systems, heart disease, kidney disease, brain disease. And not all rural is equal. About 60% of rural America lies east of the Mississippi, and about half of it lies in the south. And the southern rural part is worst affected. Drop a map of America and you plot where do you have the highest burden of diabetes? Where is the high, highest burden of obesity? Where is the highest burden of high blood pressure, stroke, heart disease? They all seem to coalesce in America's heartland, a lot in rural America. So what's wrong with rural America? Why do so many clusters, things cluster there? Here's where you have the opioid epidemic as well. If you talk to epidemiologists, they use the word syndemics. It refers to the co-clustering of disease conditions that are mutually reinforcing and that have common drivers. These rural people are people like you and me. If we lived in those areas, we could be having the same risk factor profile. That's why anthropologists call this risk factor shaming. And that's why the psychologists call it the fundamental attribution error when you blame some people instead of looking at the system. So it looks like it's not the people. If it's not the people, what's about rural America? Is it the soil? Is it the air that we breathe there? This slide plays it out for you over a 40-year period. Look at the dark brown dots, and this shows heart disease mortality in the United States. The dark brown begins right over here in the northeast, and then this moves down. Over here, by the time you reach the last part of this video, you're right down in the south. This tells us three things. One thing it tells us is that the rural mortality change is a recent phenomenon. Second thing it tells us is that geographic belts are actually dynamic. It also means that they could be reversible. So it may not be the places. So if it's not the people, if it's not the places, what is it about rural America? that makes it have lower, lower life expectancy. Could it be circumstance? The circumstances that people are born into, live in, work, age, are the most powerful determinants of health outcomes. So when you talk about rural America, you often hear about the three Ds, the divide, the rural-urban divide, disparities, desert, food deserts, education deserts, broadband deserts, job deserts, and this is the area where the dollar stores are increasing and proliferating. So what is it about circumstance? Here's one small window into circumstance. What you see in this video, the green areas are the areas of low inequality and low poverty in America, and the brown are areas of high inequality and high poverty, played out over a 30-year period. And you can see it's all green, and then it's the progressive browning of America. A lot of it becomes brown in the rural south. These are the areas where the schools are closing, the hospitals are closing, the churches are closing, and people are angry because they don't feel part of the American mainstream. The issue of rural mortality is complex and needs to be studied to a transdisciplinary lens. And that's exactly what some of us are doing. A group of investigators from 16 different institutions are studying this problem, and we have just begun a six-year-long study. And this is a team that includes sociologists, anthropologists, economists, clinicians, and it stands for Risk Underlying Rural Areas Longitudinal Study. And we're looking at the patterns and onset of disease and looking at context, circumstance, more comprehensively. Rural focuses on 10 different counties in the Southern Appalachia and the Mississippi Delta. If you rank all 3,000 counties in the US in terms of heart disease and stroke disease death rates, and look at the top 10%, the rural areas rise to the top. What's unusual and intriguing is in the same areas, which are all poor, 
match for race, there are some low-risk areas, outlier areas. And the common glib explanation is that some communities are vulnerable and some are resilient. It's a euphemism for we really don't know what's going on here. <laughs> so how do you study these? We can leverage that design of high and low-risk counties. We have to bridge the physical distance because these are remote rural areas. Do you take the signs to the people? You take the signs to the community doorstep as a mobile examination van that's fitted with everything that you would do in urban America, including smartphones and Fitbits to bridge the digital divide. But there's something else you need to bridge. You need to bridge the cultural divide. You need to first learn to partner with these communities, to listen to them, seek to understand them, so that you can identify what are the root causes of the rural health challenges. If you want to participate in rural, here's the website. Go check it out. I want to end on an uplifting note, one I call One Health, a unifying theme. The scientists say, tell us that about 60,000 years ago, Homo sapiens as a species was under stress. There are only 2,000 of us left somewhere in Africa. We were on the verge of extinction. And then something changed. We migrated, innovated. And I make this point to illustrate that we all probably came out of those 2,000 people. That's why 99% of our genomes are similar. Our physiology is similar. Our responses to stress is similar. So the rural and the urban ecosystems are not disjointed ecosystems. They are linked ecosystems. Some of the causes of the rural health challenges might well lie in our health policies, in our economic policies, in our trade practices, in our consumption patterns, which emanate from urban America. That is why we need to understand that the problem of the rural health challenges is not somebody else's story. It's your story. It's my story. It's our story. We need to work together and join hands to work towards rural health equity so that the child born in America, rural America or urban America, has the same chance, same opportunity of living out his or her maximum human potential, both in terms of longevity as well as health. That, my friends, is a moral imperative. Thank you. <laughs>